Hi everyone, it's Alex, and today I'm here to do a tag video. I was tagged by Jasmine at Jasmine's Reads with her own original tag. It is the literary fiction book tag. I'm really chuffed that Jasmine tagged me because I would say literary fiction is definitely sort of the household genre that I read and talk about on my channel. Although right from the gate, um, with the questions here, with question one about how do I define literary fiction, um, I think in its entirety, um, this is a very good tag. So I would really describe literary fiction as sort of a two-parter. On one hand, I would say I think it's any book that seeks to go beyond just solely entertaining me as a reader. And I say that because I, I don't know if anyone else does this, but when I walk into a bookstore, I do feel like I'm aware of this sort of element of being persuaded by a book. It's sort of um, a lore that whether or not I may purchase it. So I'm always aware that books themselves, you know, they do have a monetary value. Otherwise, with the publishing business, there wouldn't be a difference between books that aren't published and books that are. So for me, I think literary fiction, it's sort of like well worth my money in a way. I think other genres have merit um, that are very much worth your time and your money. But for me, I find literary fiction so rewarding because I do get that entertainment value, but I also do feel like it teaches me a lot about myself um, and the world especially. And then with a bit of more of a textbook definition of literary fiction, I would describe it as any book that encourages a reader's input on creating a cultural commentary about how the text reflects the world at large. And with that definition, I was very wary and careful about not using words like political or social in reflection to commentary because I don't think literary fiction has to do any of those things. I think it still can be cultural because um, I feel like that's sort of how classics are made, how classics really reflect um, the world in which it was written. And I also don't think this is exclusive to literary fiction. Again, I think other genres are capable of doing this, but I feel like usually the hoopla about literary fiction is that it becomes in ways sometimes controversial. I think a perfect example of that is A Little Life by Hanya Yanagihara whenever that made its rounds a few years ago. But my favorite thing about this idea of commentary and how it reflects culture is that because I think with the reader's input that I mentioned, I think the writer really trusts through literary fiction that the reader like wants to feel encouraged to sort of make these assumptions about what the writer's intentions are. Question two, ask, name a literary fiction novel with a brilliant character study. I have two options here. I have Morin from Amongst Women and I also have Sylvie from Housekeeping. I think what makes both of these characters so compelling is that many of their body of characteristics is made by the people around them. So with Morin, it's likely or um, almost entirely at the sort of uh, assumptions made by his children as they're growing up. And then we have Sylvie, who's constantly sort of analyzed by her nieces. And with Sylvie and Morin in particular, they're both, I would say, um, a bit detached from feeling self-aware about how people think about them sometimes, only because they're so caught up in their own thoughts that as readers, we don't entirely get access to. With Sylvie, I would say, um, it's like kind of largely based on her own uh, depression that I can remember. And then with Morin, I would say it's much more out of stubbornness. But with Morin especially, thinking of character study, I think it's amazing how John McGarren writes him as this standoffish, stubborn man, but who in his arguments with his children especially is quite revealing um, towards his tenderness and vulnerability. But so much of that feels essential to how what I already get to know about the children um, and how they talk about their father. Meanwhile, with Sylvie, we have her sort of interacting more, I would say, less with people, but more so her environment. There's one scene in particular in Housekeeping I think about all the time where Sylvie is out, I think, standing on a frozen lake, just sort of uh, lost in her thoughts. And Ruth, who's our narrator in Housekeeping, she just watches her. And I don't know why, to me, that's such like a powerful and haunting scene, but I think about it constantly. Question three asks to name a literary fiction novel with experimental or unique writing. For this, I would definitely say Days Without End by Sebastian Barry. It follows a character by the name of Thomas, um, and you can immediately tell that you get thrown into this sort of disarray with how you have your preconceptions about language. It takes a bit of adjusting with uh, getting used to Thomas's vernacular, 
um, because we n realize as you read the book that Thomas doesn't have much of an education. So to me, I feel like where Thomas has these scenes in the book as he's amidst the Indian Wars and describing this brutal nature of violence that he's exposed to, he relies so much on feeling and trying to articulate his feelings and goes beyond sort of what he witnesses on the battle scene and dives into his relationships with other people. I've said this before, but I feel like Days Without End has uh, probably the best first chapter I've ever read in a literary fiction book. I feel like not enough people talk about Days Without End, even though it like won a ton of awards. So if you haven't read it yet, um, I really encourage you to do so. Question four is to name a literary fiction novel with an interesting structure. And I would go with The Remains of the Day by Kazuo Ishiguro. This follows a character by the name of Stevens, who is a butler, um, but he's being basically sent away on vacation because he works so hard. But he has a new employer, so throughout the timeline of this book, it actually only takes presently um, within the span of a few days. But we understand sort of intermittently uh, throughout the book that Stevens is reflecting on his past, thinking about things like his past employer, um, his previous sort of encounters and experiences as a butler and especially with his coworkers, and sort of distancing himself um, despite feeling very much confronted by how he sort of set aside his own uh, more personal feelings that's um, separate from his own committed sense of professionalism, especially sort of sacrificing his own romantic desires. I read this a few years ago um, and I remember really liking it. I really should reread it, but I remember especially I loved the ending and I just love Stephen's development with this constant sense of evolving as a person. Question five asks to name a literary fiction novel that explores social themes. And again, I have two answers here. Um, I want to mention The New Me by Hayley Butler, and I also want to mention Convenience Store Woman by Sayaka Murata. So big shout out to probably the two most depressing books I've read this year. Um, and both of these books also deal with the concept of the workplace or just work in general. In The New Me, we follow Millie, who is just really trying to make it by with the jobs that she's given. And I feel like Really, Millie is someone that believes in hard work and doing good work, but where there's so much miscommunication that we understand uh, between other characters, it's as if it's often mistaken that her sense of doing well is mistaken as some sort of diabolical aloofness. And in Convenience Store Woman, we follow Kiko, who actually is doing quite well, um, does hard work, does good performance at work, but where she works in a convenience store, it really turns heads um, especially with her sister that doesn't really understand why she would want to stay there and also, most importantly, maybe remain single. And with both of these works, um, really I feel like um, in our time of contemporary literature, we're really in this sort of like quirky phase where like things come off as sort of deadpan and sort of inviting that way. But to me, I feel like both of these books are like self-aware for like being in that sort of marketability um, with publishing, but I feel like it's so much more than being passed off as being fun and lighthearted. I think actually with the social thematic implications of these books, it really talks about sort of the depressing nature of quality of life mixed in with professionalism. Especially, the reason I mentioned two books here is because with Convenience Store Woman, um, I don't really know a lot about like work culture um, and Asian cultures. So I mentioned The New Me because it does talk more about like an American work environment. In Millie's case for me, I think it's just sad that she really is trying her best, but she just doesn't meet the rewards of believing in the sort of system we have about work and job placement and just being a hard worker that institutions like schools have ingrained in us to believe that if you just work hard enough, you'll get what you want. And with Kiko, even though she's happy with her work placement, she's still met with sort of an onslaught of negative projections from people like her sister and also a very annoying coworker that tried to tell her that her life basically isn't enough. Question six asked me to name a literary fiction novel that explores the human condition. For this, I'd have to give it to A Month in the Country by J.L. Carr. And I say this because I'm so impressed with how small it is because it's quite short, but it deals with a character by the name of Tom and he's a veteran and he's moving to this town of Oxgodby where he finds that he finds pleasure in sort of this small town, I guess, rural life, 
even though he's there to restore a painting. I really think this book is about finding solace with the passage of time and not to feel so hesitant that maybe in your life you haven't done enough or even if you've had these sort of experiences that have clear beginnings and endings like for Tom um, in the war but also having a marriage that fell apart. I think it's really optimistic to know um, apart from the beautiful writing in this book with um, ideas of nature and just human connection. I think with such again thinking about length um, with this book it's amazing to me how much that J.L. Carr was able to sort of discuss and really create this sense of purpose and fulfillment and having a meaningful life and what that means. Question seven asked me to name a brilliant literary hybrid novel and I'm going to give this to a very recent read that I loved and that is The Stone Diaries by Carol Shields. The sense of being a hybrid to me is definitely the sense of mixing fiction and autobiography. In this case Carol Shields is using um, The Stone Diaries uh, to talk about this character by the name of Daisy. So it's just really an autobiography of Daisy's life from birth to death. So it disguises itself as feeling like it's nonfiction, but it's not. So where we are given in the Stone Diaries all of Daisy's life, um, it would make you think that you can point out all the details about what makes a life. So for me, I think what made this so literary is really pinpointing sort of how do we define our experiences or what sort of makes us conclude that this is my experience, that I own this part of what I live. This is especially interesting in Daisy's case because there are so many profound um, specific memories of her life that she holds very dear to her. Um, sadly, in ways through suffering um, or feeling guilty or severe grief. One example is that um, in Daisy's birth, her mother unfortunately passes during childbirth. And then another is that Daisy quickly becomes a widow on her honeymoon as her partner falls to his death from a windowsill. But with these two experiences, um, Daisy never actually witnesses them. Of course, being a baby, you wouldn't be able to be conscious to remember your mother dying. And then as her husband falls off the windowsill, there's this clear um, description that Carol Shields writes about how Daisy was on the bed and sort of rousing herself to feel awake and open her eyes and she clearly instead hears the sound of what sounds like a watermelon splitting. And we even get this sort of emphasis or idea or importance of the idea of a witness that I think is so amazing that Carol Shields talks about. The quote says, Life is an endless recruiting of witnesses. It seems we need to be observed in our postures or extravagance or shame. We need attention paid to us. Our own memory is altogether too cherishing, which is the kindest thing I can say for it. Other accounts are required, other perspectives, but even so our most important ceremonies, birth, love, and death, are secured by whomever, whomever and whatever is available. What chance, what caprice. And finally, question eight. Um, what do I wish was a genre that mixed more often with literary fiction? And I would actually give it to uh, books like The Stone Diaries. Um, I would love more fiction to be sort of mingled with nonfiction or autofiction, if you will. I am constantly fascinated by how writers sometimes choose to opt for fiction to talk about um, sort of what's inspired by their own life. Um, a perfect example would be Amongst Women by John McGarren, which I mentioned earlier, because I read Me or McGarren's memoir recently called All Will Be Well, and it's clear that there's so much sort of infused from that that's in Amongst Women. To me, what makes my sort of job or what I would maybe define it that way, um, because I want to, because I enjoy it, is thinking about um, the ethical implications of nonfiction weaved into fiction. And it's amazing to me because on one hand we have the writer who might feel more comfortable choosing fiction, but then again, thinking of the publishing world, I highly doubt that there would be a marketability as um, sort of rewarding to say, hey, here's this literary fiction book, but it's inspired by the author's life. Because I think, and so by admitting to that, in a way, the writer loses some sense of authority because I feel like readers automatically assume that they're going to be manipulated um, 
by the writer trying to falsify this information or at least trying to warp it in a way that they'd like. And I also think by sort of playing with fiction and nonfiction, it encourages readers to sort of examine writers more and not just the book itself. I think to me, sort of what uh, spirals me into my love of reading is whenever I read a writer's body of work. So an example would be like me reading um, many of Virginia Woolf's books and realizing how her fiction is so inspired by what's made up of her own life. And clearly then there's potential. There's potential for people to really fall in love with this idea of loving your life so much that you choose to write about it and think about it all the time. And even thinking of nonfiction, um, when I think of books, or at least um, nonfiction writers like Mary Carr or Joan Didion, I'm so compelled by their nonfiction work because it reads like literary fiction. So to me, I think there's a lot of potential. So finally, I'm gonna tag a bunch of people. Um, I there's some people I know on here that love literary fiction and some people I'd just be really curious to hear what they say. So first I have two booktubers that are kind of newer to me. So I have Roz from A Journey Through Books and I have Jenny from Bookish Shenanigans. I'd also like to tag Jack from Jack the Bibliophile, Sonia at Enthusiastic Reader, Doris at Aldi Books, Alex from Big Al Books, Sean the Book Maniac, Adam at Memento Mori, Leo at A Little Book's Life, Laura from Laura Fry, and of course, um, Steve Donahue because he smells. So that was a literary fiction book tag. Um, thank you, Jasmine, for tagging me. And if I didn't tag you in this video, uh, please feel free to do it. As always, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.